Welcome to the Sanity Project podcast, the place for internet technology professionals whose work-life balance plan has imploded. We are here to provide solutions that will help the IT pro live a sane, healthy, and prosperous life. Here's your host, Joanne Victoria. Hi, I'm Joanne Victoria, the I Know What Works coach, and I'm the author of seven books, including Lighting Your Path, How to Create the Life You Want, and Pushy for a Moment, Instant Solutions to Everyday Challenges. I'm also the host of the Sanity Project podcast, and I partner with IT professionals in telecommunications, technology, entertainment, and mass media whose work-life balance plan has imploded and who want more success, more confidence, more fun, and more inner peace. The Sanity Project podcast is a platform for experts in the personal development community to share their wisdom, expertise, and solutions that will help the IT pro live a sane, healthy, and prosperous life. Our guest today is Renaud Purifoy, and he is the author of Anger, Taming the Beast. And what Renaud will be talking to us about today is anger. Before I forget, his best website is whyemotions.com. That's W-H-Y-E-M-O-T-I-O-N-S.com. And Renault is going to talk to us about how to manage our anger, how to recognize our anger, why we get angry, and all the things about anger. So welcome to the show, Renault Purifoy. Well, thank you. It's, it's a pleasure being here. I love having you here. Because you're so smart and know so much, and you have a good name. So oh, thank what can you, thank you. what can you tell us well, about wait about anger? Well let's, well, let's start with what you know. Why we become angry? A, a, anger is one of two of our our basic natural responses to a threat. The other one is fear, and uh, we get angry if the threat seems manageable, and if the threat does not seem manageable, we become frightful or fearful. And again, anger can range from irritation to rage. Again, we usually think of the word anger as kind of that middle level, but irritation is just low-level anger, and rage, of course, is high-level. Fear, apprehension, would be low-level fear, and, of course, panic is high-level fear. They're basically two two of the same different emotions, like the flip side of the coin, the threat. And, of course, uh, whether we think we can manage the threat can vary from time to time. So sometimes we vacillate between, you know, anxiety, fear, you know, apprehension, anger. So those can get mixed up because our, our interpretation of what's going on can sometimes uh, not be clear to ourselves. Uh, probably one of the big things I run into with anger is a lot of people feel that anger is somehow a bad emotion. You know, it's, it's not a legitimate thing to happen or somehow you need to get rid of it. And it's kind of like saying, uh, well, do I have the right to be thirsty? Thirsty is a bad thing. Well, thirsty is just telling you that, you know, you need water, you need to drink something. Anger is telling you that you are perceiving a threat somewhere in your life. So what's more important is to focus on what you're doing about that threat uh, as a, rather than, you know, how you're reacting to it. And I think the other thing about that is taking a look at is the threat real or not. Because a lot of the anger that people experience uh, is over things that uh, really are not a threat. You know, the the uh, restaurant doesn't have the food that you want to order, you know, the particular dish that you're looking for. So you get all upset and angry. You know, that's not really a, a major threat in your life, you know, or somebody says something and it's not worded properly. I mean, we get a lot of that nowadays with all the political correctness stuff going on. Good Lord, uh, yes. You know, people get offended for all kinds of things when there's really no threat, but because there's a lot of distorted thinking going on in their mind and irrational beliefs and stuff, and of course, that all gets blown out of proportion. So when, when I talk with people about you know, dealing with anger, because a lot of how we respond to anger is a habit pattern. When you think about it, most of your responses during the day are pretty automatic. You don't think about them. Uh, it's because you've learned things so well, you don't have to think about it. And that's a good thing, because that allows us to drive cars and do all kinds of different things you know, without having to think about it. You know, you're driving down the freeway, you listen to the radio, you're talking to somebody, and you're hardly paying any attention to your driving because your subconscious now has learned how to, you know, do all the things and judge all the distances. And you, you only become really aware of it if a truck goes by or something unusual happens. And that's kind of the way it is in, in life. There's a part of your brain that kind of is always monitoring what's going on around you. And if you perceive something positive, uh, then... 
you get various happy emotions, you know, positive emotions, and if there's a threat, then you become either angry or frightened, depending upon again how you're ass assessing that threat. And, and even that assessment, uh, to a large degree, is automatic and based on past experience. Uh, if I let, let me digress for just a moment, because this whole whole thing of why we have emotions is kind of interesting. I, I find uh, as you go through life, you have different experiences, and you have all kinds of information coming into your mind, and you you tend not to think about it. Uh, most of that stuff, unless it's important. Uh, I thought I took that off the hook. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm sorry about that. So if something very dangerous happens in your life, that experience gets an emotional stamp. And then that stamp is going to cause that information when you encounter it again in the future to come up to your mind. Because most of the stuff that you experience in life, you know, it's it doesn't get really registered in your mind. It's just kind of goes in and goes out. But anything that's important will have either a positive or a negative emotional stamp. And those are the things that as your brain is scanning the environment, will come up. We call those emotional triggers. Um, and sometimes they're very positive and they're, they're very useful. In fact, that's why a person who has experience is more valuable than somebody who's just come out of school. Because the person who's just come out of school, he's got all this information, but the brain hasn't had time to sort it, to put an index, if you will, into that information as to what's important and what's not important. As you use the information, now your brain starts to identify, this is important, pay attention to this little detail. Oh, this is important, just pay attention to that detail. And so now you just automatically start to focus on the things that are important, which again makes the experience valuable. So anger is kind of the same way. When things happen to us uh, that make us angry in the past or that have been a threat to us in the past, and that anger emotion gets us, uh, associated with it, in the future, when those things come into our life, they automatically generate that emotion. And uh, so a lot of that's, ha and then how we respond to it is something that, again, is just an automatic behavior pattern. So when you're dealing with anger management, you're looking at two different aspects. One, uh, evaluating what is making you angry. Are they real things or are they things that are n not really uh, real in the sense of having a, a true impact on you? Are they because of things from the past or irrational beliefs or things like that? And the second part is, what is your response? How are you dealing with uh, a threat when you encounter it? So you're saying, obviously, the people with more life experience will could respond differently to quote unquote anger uh, or the the feeling of anger. Is that well, uh, well, a memory? And, 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 well, I, again, experience just in general is more uh, valuable in terms of being able to utilize the information in your brain. So we're kind of talking two different things. But in terms of what you just said, yes, the way you respond to threat is something you learned as you grew up. You learned it partly through modeling off the parents around you or the adults around you, and you also learned part of it through trial and error. You did things, and they either worked or didn't work, and so you repeated the things that seemed to work in your environment. And, and let me give you kind of an, uh, oh, maybe an excessive example. Uh, a person grows up in a family where there's a lot of violence, okay? And there's a couple possible ways they can learn. They can either mirror that violence, or they can learn, if I shut my mouth up and stay in the background, nothing bad happens to me. And so now that becomes their pattern when they encounter a threat, is they back off. And again, the first example, they encounter a threat, and they get angry, and they go out and they demolish it. Sure. And it's, it's, it's an exaggeration either way, because they grew up in an environment that was exaggerated. Okay. And that's automatic. They don't, and, and again, as an adult, when you're talking to them, they'll say, I don't understand why I respond that way. It's just the way I am. Well, yes, it is the way you are because you've trained yourself to be that way. And you can train yourself to be another way. So when you're working with somebody who has a short temper, uh, the first thing they have to learn is to take a time out, to not do anything when anger first comes up. Because their habit pattern is to go out and, you know, get rid of that threat, just bowl over it, you know, and take it out. And they need to learn, no, stop. And that's a hard thing to learn. You know, in fact, when you have domestic violence situations, the cool-down period is the first thing you try to lock into place. Is you've got to walk away. Uh, and then after you're calm, then you decide what you're going to do about it. When you look at people who deal with threats well, that's the first thing they do, is they kind of stop for a moment, they pause, they kind of get their composure, then they make a decision about what they're going to do. And that's a habit pattern that they've learned as they grew up. Again, possibly by modeling, possibly because of the way they're wired. I mean, there's, 
there's a lot of things that go into how you how you learn to respond. You know, part of it's your personality, part of it's your environment, you know, part of it's the training that you receive, you know, all those different things. Then, uh, because the anger itself is an automatic response. If you perceive a threat, you're going to get angry, you know. And again, the level depends upon whether you escalate it or not, you know, how you, how you deal with that. So essentially, I have four things I have people work through. First of all, when you're angry, uh, is there a real threat? Okay, because if there's not, then you need to just not do anything until you figure out, why am I getting angry over the situation where there's not a real threat, right? There's either some belief system I have or some trigger from the past that's causing that. If there's a real threat, what am I going to do about it that's going to minimize the threat with the least amount of harm to myself and others? And, and that's why I define as an appropriate behavior in our culture. Again, we're not in an you know, Afghan war setting or something like sure. that. Sure, yeah. yeah. If you're in the office, you know, what am I going to do to minimize that threat that's not going to, you know, harm myself or others, at least to the, the greatest degree that I can? And uh, that takes some planning. Uh, well, that also takes some maturity and awareness, right? Well, exactly. And I, <laughs> not a lot of that sometimes. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, but this is what you're, you know, you're inferring here is that, right. you know, obviously you might have changed your habit and pattern and but uh -huh. things can change over time if you decide to take the different paths might come from number one experience but also to the well it's also experience to become mature um right. you know some people are 80 and they're still not mature um well you, you, the thing that made a lot of sense to me a long time ago is, is i have this concept i use with people of core beliefs and they're not beliefs in the traditional sense. They're more a collection of condition response patterns. But they're kind of like, you know, what you feel or think about yourself in terms of who I am, you know, your, what relationships you're all about, uh, you know, is the world safe, is it dangerous, you know, those types of things. And most of those core beliefs were developed when you were a small child. And, they, again, they grew up based upon the models around you and your experience as you were a child. So the average adult is walking around with a set of core beliefs that a little kid came up with. And that, in a nutshell, explains all the crazy stuff you see. <laughs> I know. There, it, it is. You're, you're true. And it's like uh, elementary school. We're not talking about high school either. We're just mm -hmm. talking about elementary school because prior to, you know, you're just labeling it that way. I just think everything is high school. and People act as if they are still in high school. A lot of time, you know, and so it requires some introspection, taking some time to take a look at, you know, where is that coming from inside of me? You know, what do I really believe about that? And then also looking at some of those automatic behaviors that you developed uh, as you grew up. And again, unfortunately, that's not real popular <laughs> in our Western culture. Uh, but it is something that does lead to maturity, as you say. Well, I think people now, a lot of people now just want to be right about their positioning, certainly reacting and responding as if you're eight years old when you're 28 or 38 or 48 or 58, at, you know, fill in yeah. the blank, is ridiculous. And they well, need... And, and, and part of the problem is we live such uh, lives where we're bombarded so much and our brain is kept so busy with external stimuli. You know, in the old days, if you had to go into town to get some groceries or something, that was like an all-day trip. Mm -hmm. you, know, you had lots of time to talk to people. You had lots of time on your own to kind of think about your life and what was going on. And so that helped in that maturing process as you're describing it. And nowadays, we're just so busy, you know, with one thing after another, wham, bam, it comes into our brain. And we never take a breath to really think about, well, where's that coming from? You know, what do I really think and feel about that? You know, it's just we're just reacting, reacting, reacting. And I think that contributes uh, to the, uh, the uh, immaturity that we see so much in our society. Plus the fact that so much of it's modeled in our media. I mean, you look at movies and uh, especially a lot of the music that's going on nowadays and, you know, the level of maturity in it is fairly low. Uh, and so that reinforces that that's the way, that's reality. That's the way I'm supposed to respond. I used to teach in a, a local college here and... Uh, you know, a lot of 20-somethings were in there, and it was amazing how many of them thought what they saw on sitcoms was reality, or they look at a reality show and they actually think it's real. Uh, it's it's this, this blur between reality and illusion that's created by our media seems to 
keep getting thinner and thinner, the line between those two. I know. Um, it's disturbing. Um, I see great changes in, um, I use television to relax and I watch certain things, but most of it is just so bad now. Um, they have diluted the um, perspective and brought it all down to, I like watching older TV series because right. they right. were more textured. Uh, the writing was superb. You couldn't get away with the writing then as you can now um, because I'm of the, you know, the generations that understand that if it's not on the page, it doesn't exist if you don't write it properly. But I like old stuff because it was written better. It was written better for people's intelligence. Mm -hmm. And now it's the television and the movies you're catering to the lowest level possible. And I don't know if it's the lowest level of emotions, the lowest level of maturity, whatever it is, it's very base. And, and as you were talking about the music, and it's just... It's it's like it's embarrassing to me mm -hmm. uh, to think that this is what our world has been diluted to, D E L U as well as D I L U diluted, and to that's the level that we're at where people are accepting this simplistic, ultra simplistic view of life, of words, of 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 personalities. It, it's disturbing. And not only that, there's a lot of modeling of immature behavior, you know, of how to react when you're upset, how to react when somebody uh, says something that you don't like. And so that becomes the model that people are following. Yes, if they don't like what somebody says, they call the police. Right, or they get in their face. <laughs> well, yeah, or kill them, right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is, but it's but, like... I don't know how we – uh, well, it's deteriorating over the last few decades, but I, uh, there's usually a series of events that occur that, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. It happens over time, and I don't know when that hot spot or when, when it jumped the shark that we started catering to uh, the basest part of people, and well, I can – Go ahead. You know, when you're advertising, the two things that sell are sex and fear. So right. You see that those two things in any kind of uh, advertisement, either some kind of sexual thing going on or are you sure? Are you sure this is going to happen and you can protect yourself? You know, one of those two kinds of ideas. And I think the other part of it is the fact that our technology is still relatively new. You know, it takes a couple of generations for us to learn how to, act more maturely towards the technology and uh, Facebook and all these things, all the different social media that's going on. It's all a fairly new technology. And you, know, you see a lot of people now beginning to talk about, well, wait a minute, how are we using it? This thing that was going to be this wonderful, you know, thing for everybody. We're realizing there is a dark side to it and people do get addicted to it. And oh yeah. And it does affect how people view themselves and view the world, view the world. So, uh, that awareness is just beginning, and hopefully, you know, uh, in the next over the next twenty years, we'll be able to use it in a more mature way. But uh, we'll see. Well, if you have immature people using an immature product, there's yeah. the, it's going to take a while. Somebody has to just come in and and I think the process of knocking it down. I guess that's the words I'm using right now. Mm -hmm. uh, demolishing something before it can be rebuilt or at least certain aspects of it, so that something better can come from it. As you say, a more mature use of mm. social media, if that's even possible. In mm. fact, um, it's, it's, I think social media, the existence of social media and people's use of it in the way they're using it has been disastrous. For the most part, yeah. I mean, I... That's why I don't spend a lot of time on social media. I, I do enough that I, you know, to promote my my uh, interviews like this one today and things of that nature. But sure. I, I, I don't spend a lot of time there because that's I've got other things I want to do with my life. Yeah, it is a time suck and um, and an energy suck. And people say, well, "Why don't you do this?" I said, "It's too much, and I don't need to do that." Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't even read the newspapers. I do see headlines on my phone. Of course, they show up, and I just glide by them because I can't do anything about certain things. You have to know where you can't 
where, where you do and have power or do not have power. Right. You know, I mean, people talk about you know politics at its highest level. Well, there's no control there. What you can control is things that are in front of you. You can control yourself. People are unaware that it starts with from within. So if within they're just angry all the time, mm-hmm. that has to change. That's you know not that people like to change, but. Yeah. Well, and that again gets back to what I said earlier. You know, we don't do a lot of introspection, and what we do with it, for the most part, is not effective for a lot of people. But taking time to, to take a look at, you know, what really makes a person a happy person in life. You know, it's it's things that you don't see in the media a whole lot. Your relationships are super important. And in fact, uh, there's essentially you can boil it down to three things that will make you fairly happy in life. First of all, you have to have a purpose. You have to have a reason to get up in the world in, in the morning, right? You have to have relationships, and that's one of the things that probably we're the most impoverished with uh, today. Um, again, it used to be people had lots of relationships with extended family and you know their village and all that sort of thing. But nowadays we don't have that. You know, we're very isolated. We open our garage door opener. We go to work with our headset on. We come home with our headset on. We open the garage door. We come in, walk down in front of the media, and no interaction, no real interaction with people. And so that's important. And then the third thing, which is again a hard sell sometimes, is is your, uh, your what I call your spiritual existential side. You know, what is life all about? You know, why am I here? Is there a God? Is not a girl God? What what's my purpose in life? Uh, you know, those types of existential questions. And if you're solid in all three of those areas, then you tend to be a fairly happy camper. If you're hurt in just one area, then you'll bend, but, you know, you'll make it through. And if you've got two areas that you're weak in, you're going to have a lot of problems in life. In fact, that's one of the things I used when I was working with people. Is uh, if, In fact, if you look at, like, at the situations where somebody's had something really tragic happen to them and they've come out fairly intact, you'll find that, indeed, they had a relationship that they could cling on to, and they had some kind of a foundational belief system that helped them get through that situation. Uh, and that's that's something that's sorely lacking with a lot of people now. You ask them what they believe, and maybe they don't know. Or they'll give you some kind of pop answer that they've heard someplace, but they really don't understand what they're saying. Correct. Well, I want everybody to know that Renaud Purify holds a master's degree in counseling and is the author of four books. His first book, Anxiety, Phobias, and Panic, has gone through three revisions and sold over 200,000 copies. Renaud was in private practice for 20 years as a marriage and family therapist specializing in anxiety disorders. He retired from private practice to teach at a local college in Sacramento, California, and is now spending time writing, speaking, and seeing people with anxiety-related problems as a pastoral counselor. He has also developed a YouTube channel with over 200,000 views that features videos on practical life skills. Um, if you're looking at a page, either the Sanity Project page on Facebook or my website at AskJoanneVictoria.com, you will see I have all of his links there that include his YouTube channel. And if you go to his YouTube channel, you will see things that he talks about similar to what he's talking about today. So if a person were to start Taming the Beast today, if they even understood what you were talking about in the slightest and thought, hmm, maybe I want to change my life just a bit. Maybe I want to have a little more, few more relationships and understand why I'm here on this planet and what I'm supposed to be doing. What would you say is a first step for them is if you can define, you know, get down to a first step. Well, the easiest thing would be go to the website because I've got a four part series on anger that I talk about all this stuff in detail. But it's you know that 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 would probably be the, the easiest answer because there's there's I can't give you a simple formula because it's it's a complex issue. Um, if you've got anger issues, then you need to get some resources where you can take a look at yourself in a systematic way. Uh, one of the problems I find with change with people uh, when I teach guitar because I still do a little bit on the side, uh, people will say you know practice makes perfect, and I always tell them no, that's not true. Practice makes permanent. So if you're grabbing your cord the wrong way, you're just making a bad habit real permanent. And it's going to take twice the energy to undo the old habit pattern and redo the new one. And since we're talking about habitual ways of thinking, habitual ways of acting, 
you need a game plan for doing that. So the easiest way, it doesn't cost you any money, is just to go to the, the website and or the YouTube channels and take a look at that series. And if you want to go further, then there's materials there that show you where you can go as well. So everybody who's listening, go to whyemotions.com. That's the word why, W-H-Y emotions.com. Or you can go to our Purify. They're not going to get this one, but I'll... I'll, Whyemotions.com. Whyemotions.com. Because I have to spell his name out to make it really clear to most people, 99% of the people who are listening, who I'm not saying you're dumb people. I'm just saying That's a hard name. His name is Renault Purifoy, and I don't want you to spell it P-U-R-E. So well, go to that's, why. That's, that was the original spelling about four generations ago. <laughs> oh, see, I hit on it again. So go to whyemotions.com. And I also want to say, tell everybody to refer this podcast. There's so much information in this podcast because Renault speaks quickly, which is fine by me. I like that. But you, I don't want you to miss any nuance. And there's some hard information in here. So re-listen to this podcast and recommend it to your friends. Just share it with anybody that you know. And then when you go to iTunes, please give Renault Purifoy a five-star review and note that the more... Uh, the more great reviews that a guest has, Renault Purifoy being the one in the moment, the more people will listen because some people just need to see what somebody else said before they'll take a chance. And then go to my website at askjoannevictoria.com and you can download a free book, free, free, free. It's called The True Self Handbook, A Guide to Transform Your Life. And it has many, many pages that you can also look at. So Renault gives you free information on his website, Why Emotions. And I'm giving you free information on my website, which is askjoannevictoria.com. And it's The True Self Handbook, A Guide to Transform Your Life. And if you have any questions, you can email me at askjoannevictoria at gmail.com. Well, I thank you, Renault, for being here today. It's been great. And I look forward to speaking to you again. Yes. Take care. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Sanity Project Podcast. Please go to AskJoanneVictoria.com and continue the conversation on my podcast page. And get a free copy of my book, The True Self Handbook, A Guide to Transform Your Life. That's AskJoanneVictoria.com. Take care and thanks for being here.